and with perfect timing. He must have known this months ago. I don't know how he does it, but he's written a book called Make the Liberal Party Great Again. What better timing? Welcome to Outsiders, John Ruddick. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for having me. Good to have you back on Outsiders, John. Yes. You are a regular here. You're a po very popular with Outsiders out there. Tell us, firstly, before we get into the nitty-gritty of the last few days, yes. uh, the thesis behind Make the Liberal Party Great Again, your book. OK, so what has happened over the last several decades in countries which are most similar to Australia, I'm talking Canada and the United Kingdom in particular, but other countries as well, they have democratised how they choose their candidates, their, their parliamentary leaders. So what they do is, in, the best example, and what the book argues is that the party we need to emulate is the Canadian Conservative Party. So Stephen Harper was the equivalent of uh, John Howard in Canada. He was Prime Minister for about 12 years. He lost a federal election in 2015 and he resigned the parliamentary leadership. The party room elected an interim leader who was just so they could function in Parliament. But that interim leader was prohibited from the real contest. The real contest was an 18-month campaign, 16 candidates nominated, they were given a $5 million spending limit, uh, TV debates, and they had to crisscross the country and they had to convince uh, the 300,000 or so members of the Canadian Conservative Party that they should be the leader of the Conservative Party. Now, it was a... This is the, the, the best part about it is, it was a big debate about policy. It wasn't about all this deal-making, say, I'll vote for you and I'll get my mates to vote for you if you make me the Defence Minister. It was all about saying, look, vote for me because I believe in A, B and C. Or other people say, I believe in X, Y and Z. It was terrific. And now they've got a very good leader of the opposition. This is what we need to do in Australia. OK. Um, let's contrast that with <laughs> the way in which this decision was made, yes. uh, the way in which the previous change of leader uh, was made. Let's, let's go through... You, you give us John Ruddock's analysis of what's just happened. Well, it's heartbreaking for people who love the Liberal Party and who love Australia because the Liberal Party and its ancestors have run this country for about 75% of the time since Federation. There's been 45 federal elections in this country. Labor's only won 14. So the Liberal Party and its ancestors... Is the, is, has basically been the board of directors that have run this country. Australia is such a great country in so many respects that our politics is dysfunctional. Now, we've got 83 people in a secretive room in Canberra. Now, of those 83 people, about a third of them, if, when the leader gets up, is going to be promoted to the front bench. Much bigger salary, staff, a lot more TV. Status. Stuff. That's right, OK. And more power. appearances on Sky News. Yeah, absolutely. They're queuing to get on Outsiders, Ross. Obviously. My phone stopped, hasn't stopped ringing. Keep going. When you think about it, it's government corruption 101. So these 83 people are going to vote for who the leader is, and then immediately after the leader is chosen, that leader is going to promote one-third of them to these powerful positions. I'm sorry, it's a conflict of interest. The Liberal Party has not changed since Federation about how we choose our leader. Other political parties, including the Labor Party, to their credit, to some extent, they evolve about how we... This is the most critical decision the party makes, how we choose our leader, and we need to bring it into the 21st so century. So tell us, according to the book's thesis, you having studied the comparative model of all of yes. these other countries, Australia, who started out in the forefront of Absolutely. democratic reform, yes. has now fallen to the very back of the okay. pack. Yes. So it gives us an option to learn from what everyone else is doing, to find the very best practice model. Correct. Um, and so, so tell us, um, what is that model? What does it look like? OK, so what the Labor Party did was they said, and this is how it started in the UK in, with the British Labor Party, they said, we're going to give the membership some of a say. And so the, the, the caucus wall, the party room, will still have you know, a majority say or half a say. But what they do in Canada is, uh, if you're a member of parliament, you get one vote, just like if you're, you know, uh, Mr and Mrs Smith out there in Saskatchewan. Um, so, and now, now, there is a fierce... Uh, uh, competition when you're a leadership candidate in Canada to get parliamentarians to endorse your campaign. So that's important. And, uh, you know, there's... And, and there's, there's a, people come out on their website, they put a long... These are the people who've endorsed me. So that's good, OK, but if we want this to be a truly uh, democratic result, we need to empower as many people as possible. What will end up happening is the Liberal Party will... Membership will grow in fold... It will grow in size about five times the size. We'll have a lot more money, cos the Liberal Party is completely broke right now. And unlike last time, when Malcolm Turnbull, who's built wealthy, could write out a cheque for almost $2 million, we do not have that option now. We need membership, and the best way to get membership is to give them a vote on who they want to be the parliamentary leader. Well, I see 
Professor Peter Van Onselen is saying that the era of mass, mass membership parties is over. What is your answer? Well, that's, that, that is only the case in Australia because I have seen thousands of people join the Liberal Party, come along to one or two meetings and not come back. Now, these are people who are true believers, but they just realise that, that very few people have any say in the Liberal Party. So, I, all those people who've joined the Liberal Party in the past and not come back, if they, could, if they could have had a vote this week about Dutton, Bishop, Turbull, Abbott, whoever, people would say, yes, I'll pay my $30 or whatever it is to join the Liberal Party. Yes, I'd like to have a say on that. Now, speaking of that, so John Howard has come out and said Tony Abbott should be whacked straight back into the ministry. We don't know if Scott Morrison will do that or not. Um, uh, Andrew Lamming was saying that, uh, no, 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 get rid of him, and there's a lot of people saying, oh, no, blaming him for, for the change of, of government, uh, which is strange. Um, your thoughts on the future of Tony Abbott? I think it's an absolute no-brainer, and I, my hunch was, before I read this media speculation, my hunch was that Tony Abbott, of course, that Scott Morrison, of course, would let him back in. I mean... Uh, there, is an there are millions of people across this country who, have a, who hold Tony Abbott in a very high regard. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a tight election. You know, the betting markets now, if you put $1 on Labor to win the next election, you're only going to get $1.20 back, yeah. OK? You put $1 on the Liberal Party, you're going to get $4.40 back. Now, I think it will tighten, but we need everything we've got. Now, Tony Abbott is... Uh, there is uh, millions of people out there who have him in high regard. I'm pretty sure... But I could be wrong, but I, I would... I, it would only be spite why they would not bring Tony back at that time. Well, back the other thing it could be is that you wind up in a situation where you've only got a certain number of cabinet positions available. Yeah. There's a strong feeling you have to reward those who helped you to get there. Well, that's true. Because all these deals have been done that we... See, in Canada, where it's all transparent and out in the open, all this stuff's been happening in camera behind closed doors. Mm. So there's been all these phone calls and all this arm twisting, and a lot of it would have been, a hell of a lot would have been is, I will vote for you if I get X portfolio. OK, you've spoken about Canada a couple of times. Let's just have a quick listen to Doug Ford, the recent uh, Premier uh, of, uh, of Ontario. Won an election very single-mindedly going against climate change. Let's have a listen to Doug Ford. I want to confirm that in Ontario, the carbon taxes days are numbered. In fact, upon the swearing in of my new cabinet, at the top of our agenda, the very first item will be to pass an order to cancel the Liberal cap-and-trade carbon tax. As of June the 29th, the cap-and-trade, the carbon tax, they're gone, they're done. So this bloke wins virtually in a landslide. He yes. took it hard. And there was no mistaking what he was talking about there. There was no kind of fudging, let's lower emissions and lower prices and do this and construct this lunatic thing. Yes. It was, we're getting out of the thing. Yes. In the, the Brazilian president, I can't pronounce his name off the top of my head, but, um, the, uh, oh, sorry, wow. the candidate, the mm. candidate, he's the front runner to be the next Brazilian uh, president. Uh, he said climate change is all rubbish, we're pulling out of the Paris Agreement. Mm. The uh, Ross, alternative for Germany. Ross detailed how the alternative party Largest Germany, opposition party, they say, gonski. Gone, it's getting out of here. Uh, okay. Around the world, we're seeing, and then you see countries like China, which just laugh at the yes. <laughs> entire concept yes. of Paris, and uh, other countries which quite rightly see it as a milk cow like Pakistan, who said, yeah, yeah, of course we'll lower our emissions, give us 100 billion bucks. Mm. Um, so, can the Liberal Party... Well, two questions. Why haven't they seen sense and seen the way forward? Secondly, can they actually go, yep, this is how we defeat Labor. This is how we win that election and bring the whole army of Australians mm. whose number one priority is cheap energy prices and only one in four give a rats about climate change. Yes. Can they do it, the Liberal Party? OK, this is how I see it. I believe there is a man-eating bunyip lurking in the <laughs> woods around Canberra. <laughs> this man-eating bunyip yes. only <laughs> likes to dine out on the flesh of the parliamentary leader of the Labor Party or the Liberal Party. Now, the, the name of this man-eating bunyip is Global Warming Policy <laughs> and Scott Morrison, I'm sorry... He's still on the loose. He's on bunyip. the loose. The bunions okay. out there, Scott. He keeps eating up people <laughs> in your position, Scott Morrison. <laughs> so let's try and break the pattern, Scott. And the answer, of course, with global warming policy is this. The government should get out of it. Now, if exactly. people who believe in global warming want to, want to reduce emissions, if they, if they are right, they should not be focused their energy on trying to manipulate government policy. They should be saying to the public, convince the, the majority of the public that it's the right thing, and then the public can, and then energy providers can say, look, 
Uh, you believe in global warming. Uh, use us because we only use renewable energy. Yes, I have to pay a higher price. But that, that should be persuading the people, mm. not through lobbyists manipulating government policy. Mm. Absolutely. Hear, hear. And uh, what a revolution that would be in this country. And it would be the free market at work rather than this endless government mm. intervention. And no one must know more than Josh mm. Ross. Yes. That you can't reconcile the irreconcilable. Well, look, I, w I would not want to put it to, to Josh and to Scott. Um, when the... At the early days of Hong Kong, the establishment of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. um, there was this massive influx of Chinese from the mainland into Hong Kong and because it was going to be this new liberty. And they were all just spread all over the city. Like, tens of thousands of them had no, were sleeping in shanties. And the message came back from the Home Office in London well, to the Hong Kong administrator, well, you must do something, but you must have a policy to settle these homeless. And the administrator of Hong Kong looked at it and said, you know what, my policy is going to be, I've got no policy. I'm going to let you guys figure this out, OK? And the truth is, if we looked at... If we had never had an energy policy, we would have a much better result. Absolutely. Indeed, if we had never had an education policy, mm. we would not be slipping We'd further, further. If we never had Kazakhstan an would have been... BN policy, we would have a better communications <laughs> network. My advice to Scott and Josh is stay out of it. <laughs> now, we're going to go to a break in a second, but first of all, I think in the interest of fairness, uh, we've been a bit harsh earlier, so I think in the interest of fairness, I'd like to list uh, Malcolm Turnbull's achievements yes. during his time in... Uh, mm, mm, hang on. <laughs> sure, I, sure I got it here somewhere. Uh, we're going to a short break and we will be back <laughs> in a tick. Welcome back, you're on Outsiders with Rowan Dean, Ross Cameron, author and democracy campaigner John Ruddick yeah. has just written a book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again. Um, there is... Um, uh, in the book... Yes. ..you talk about, you sort of sketch out this new world, what it will look like, a yes. policy-based campaign yes. uh, rather than a backroom factional deal. Yes. And <clears throat> the high watermark of your model is the convention, uh, which looks to me like it could be a really great party. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you talk about all the people, the army of people who are former members of the Liberal Party who joined, went to a branch meeting and said, I never want to do that again. That's right. <laughs> right? But this is something that will be like a, an event everyone will want. Tell us what it looks like. OK. Since the death of Harold Holt in 1968, or late 1967, the Liberal Party, more than 50% of the time, has been haunted by leadership destabilisation. Now, what that does is it weakens the leader and it just has many negative flow-on effects. So what we... Give us the list of destabilised leaders. Oh, well, it would need half an hour, but, I mean, OK, John Gordon and Billy McMahon was... If, if there was a worse week than this week for the Liberal Party, it was in ni February 1971 when John Gordon and Billy McMahon had the most incredibly bitter fight. Okay? And it resulted in a tied vote. A tied vote. OK, keep do. going. Okay. Who else? Well, then Andrew Peacock had a very bitter challenge against Malcolm Fraser and basically helped bring down that government in 1981. Andrew Peacock and, and uh, John Howard, you know, were, were in cat cat you know, non-stop conflict in the 1980s, 1990s, you know, down at Houston, OK, just non-stop. So, and even, even, we look back at the Howard era as a period of stability, which it is now in, in, in uh, comparison to the last decade, but I'm sorry, every two years or so under the Howard government, there was that Howard and Costello was front-page news. OK, now... What we need to do is we need to make this a much more orderly process because sometimes a leader should be challenged. Of course, we want that to be the case. So what I'm proposing is that every three years, midway through the federal parliamentary term, that there is a national convention in a capital city. Let's say it's in Brisbane. And then all the members in other capital cities and anywhere else in Australia, little country towns, can watch it by satellite and can vote. It'll be run by the Australian Electoral Commission. They'll get up and they'll have... Well, there'll be TV debates leading up to the convention, but on Good the... for Sky News, oh, TV fantastic. debate. You could host yes. one of them. Mm -hmm. That'd yes. be great. Absolutely. Yeah. And Spears, then... he can do another, it'd be perfect. No, we, we want... Yeah, and keep Carry going, on. keep okay. going. OK, so there will be... So there'll be a big lead-up, but it'll only really go for a month or two. Yeah. And most of the time, the successful incumbent will be simply... He won't be challenged. Yeah. OK? Which is fine. But so if somebody wants to become the federal parliamentary leader under this model, they're going to have to, like, impress the public and yes. the party. Yeah. OK? Now, now, it means that there won't be any of this scheming and deal-making and leaks and undermining, because that will actually hurt you if you want to be a leadership candidate. Yeah. It'll be a beautiful process. Uh, most of the time, the, the, the incumbent will be successful and will say, no, we want you to continue on. Uh, but sometimes there'll be a challenge and, and, it, and it'll be... 
there'll be a one month period every three years where people say you can either put up or you can shut up. You're either going to challenge now or it's not going to happen for another. Now the last Fantastic. thing I'm going to okay. the last thing I'm going to say you uh, get you to outline it, and it comes from your thesis from Aristotle's wisdom of oh, yeah. crowds as the philosophical basis for it. Yes. But your model is going to adopt the Canadian approach, yes. which says you don't even have to be a member of Parliament to nominate for the leadership of the Liberal Parliamentary Party. Is that right? Absolutely. There are no two countries on earth more similar than Canada and Australia. So we're both uh, constitutional monarchies, federations of states, we're English speaking, we've got about the same land mass, we've got the same, same economy, same population, but we are so different, OK? And our constitutions are also very similar. Now, um, in Canada, uh, three of their greatest Prime Ministers in the last 100 years were not members of Parliament when they won one of these national conventions and went on to become Prime Minister. You had Mackenzie King, who's like the Robert Menzies of, uh, of Canada, Brian Mulroney, who was the Ronald Reagan of Canada, and Stephen Harper. These Fantastic. people were not <clears throat> members of Parliament when they won a national convention. Now, what happens is, when they run for the leadership, they, they get a backbench to say, OK, if Stephen Harper gets up, I will retire and have a by election, then the other parties don't continue. Well, I just think it's in Australia's interest. When I asked one person, yeah. what is your reaction to what's happened in Canberra, the answer was, do I have any choice? That's right. OK? That's right. The answer is, no, you don't. We're yeah. trying to create options. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, now, I was joking before, of course, Malcolm Turnbull has a legacy. We're going to briefly look at it, uh, uh, very briefly. Um, unemployment, down low. 5.4% is it? It's stayed low? Well, look, is that a it, legacy, it, an it, achievement? It annoys me when politicians take credit for the economy when it's clearly just a case of the natural cycle. Of the, now, has there been any pro-business, free market, <laughs> that's right types of policies coming out of this government? No. One small, okay, one, cut, one, one, small, one little tax cut for small business is not nothing. <laughs> Um, OK, well, OK, well, OK, yes, that's a positive. OK, well, we're one little thing. OK, okay. the next is, of course, same-sex marriage. That will be, I think, Malcolm Turnbull's legacy, whether you agreed with it, wanted it, didn't want it, whatever. Uh, that was Malcolm Turnbull's legacy. Now it's but time for... he didn't for... even campaign what? for it. He didn't even <laughs> campaign for same-sex marriage. Trying to give the guy <laughs> something. Maybe he said <laughs> me not campaigning was the reason why it that's succeeded. Maybe that's why that's it got why he gets... That's why, that's why. And when he did campaign for the Republic, that went down in flames. Uh, now, we've got a special lefty lunacy. OK, this is the Malcolm Turnbull lefty lunacy, devoted to carrying on that thought of legacy and achievement. So I thought we'd start off, uh, well, with as many to, to go for, but uh, the Menzies speech, where you referred to earlier, uh, where Malcolm Turnbull got up and decided that Robert Menzies, the great Conservative leader, was in fact, to quote, a progressive. Uh, and uh, he tried to claim that uh, line for himself as well on his departure. So that was a bit of lefty lunacy. Uh, but well, let's... here, pause. What do yep. you say about that? Tim Wilson uh, the, says that people should read a bit of philosophy and okay. understand. What, what do you say when about that? When I woke up and heard what Malcolm Turnbull had said about Robert Menzies in London that morning, I, I, I thought, OK, he's clearly never read <laughs> one biography of Robert Menzies. <laughs> Anyone who knows just a little bit about Robert Menzies. OK, let's have a listen. In 1944, Menzies went to great pains not to call his new political party, consolidating the centre-right of Australian politics, conservative, but rather the Liberal Party, which he firmly anchored in the centre of Australian politics. The sensible centre, to use my predecessor Tony Abbott's phrase, was the place to be, and it remains the place to be now. So, there you go, John. I think you've said it all. You woke up in shock horror when you... OK. Now, <laughs> this is Robert Menzies. If he was alive today, he would be described as being part of the hard right of the Liberal Party. <laughs> That's what he was. That is what he was. Now, when it was the United Australia Party, and he, was, he would get attacked for being too what they called reactionary at the time. So, when he came along in the mid-1940s to start a new party, he had to get away from this image of being too right-wing. And so, he said... I know what I'll do. I'll come up with a marketing technique. I'll call it the Liberal Party. And that is all it was. <laughs> now, as Prime Minister, he tried to ban the Communist Party. He was, uh, he was friends with South Africa. There's a, he was an okay, well, let's, monarchist. Let's look at a bit more lefty lunacy. Let's go to uh, the bonking ban. So, do we remember the bonking ban? So, uh, this was uh, hardly a kind of conservative policy, Ross, was it? Uh, let's well, have a listen to... Uh, have we got him here with his bonking ban? Let's have a listen. Ministers regardless of whether they are married or single, must not engage in sexual relations with their staff. 
<laughs> there you go. John, what do you make of the bonking ban? Well, look, it's just Malcolm's instincts where if there's a problem, regulate it. You know, put <laughs> okay. more stuff on it. I'm going to rush through these because we've got to go to a break in a second. But all the Paris, the ratifying Paris we've talked about, the uh, snowy mountains pushing water uphill, batteries in the desert. We had the f half billion, which Ross referred to earlier, going to some reef mob who only went, oh, the problem with the reef is climate change. We don't know what to do with the half billion. Uh, this was all lefty lunacy. Uh, we had, of course, the the budget, uh, the 2017 budget, John, was described as... Uh, well, Ross Gittins described it as a... He said some people might detract, de uh, attack this as being Labor light, but Labor would even dare bring in, try and bring in a budget like this. Well, the government spending and increased taxes. And Anthony Albanese, a week later, said, we should celebrate the 2017 budget. This is a triumph for the Labor movement. <laughs> because, you know, when, when Menzies founded the Liberal Party, it was, f it was a... If there were, its absolute inner core was free enterprise. That was its number one founding issue, free enterprise, which means low government spending. Progress. And which means pulling out of Paris. Now, we're going to go to a short break. I want to thank John Ruddock for being yeah. with us and guiding us through uh, well, all that's been going on. And by his book, Make the Liberal Party Great Again, and thank Scott you. Morrison and Josh Frydenberg, read it too, because this is your chance to make the Liberal Party and the country great again.